Hey folks, this is Aestus. This video is going to be a little different in the first place because it's a podcast format. That means just audio, no video. Feel free to watch if you like, but you won't be seeing anything other than this screen right now. It's also going to be different because it is the very first video where I have on a guest, a very special guest and a friend of mine, to discuss this movie, Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves. So I'm going to begin with a spoiler-free monologue where I give my opinion on the movie, and then after that we will have on our guest where I'll talk to him about that opinion and get his own opinions on the movie, and that interview section is going to be a spoiler-free for all. So if you're worried about spoilers, stop after my monologue. All right, let's get right to it. I'll start with the part that you clicked on this to hear, which is my general opinion. I didn't like Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves. There were parts of the movie that were fun, but as a lifelong enjoyer of the D&D hobby, I felt it failed to do the main thing a D&D movie should do, which is inspire me to want to play Dungeons & Dragons and to dive into Dungeons & Dragons intellectual properties. Honor Among Thieves promised to be the movie me as a kid always wanted, namely a high-budget, action-packed comedy set in the Forgotten Realms. Let's start with his portrayal of the Forgotten Realms. At a surface level of mere references, it gets a lot of things right. The movie was peppered with familiar locations, factions, and monsters. Axe beaks, rust monsters, intellect devourers, and other classic beasts from the first edition of the Monster Manual make an appearance. The Harpers, the Red Wizards, the Emerald Enclave are all there. The third act takes place in the city of Neverwinter, a kingdom that seems to be perpetually thriving despite the many plagues, invasions, and general anti-human flourishing events that I've personally played through in that city. To be honest, they called it Neverwinter, but I did not recognize it as the Neverwinter from the IPs fans of D&D are likely familiar with, and that was the problem running through the whole movie. It's clear to me that the writers of this movie were not inspired by the Forgotten Realms, and as a result, the setting has never seemed more fake, which is, frankly, the death knell of any setting. If I can't imagine it as a real place, I'm not going to want to set any of my games there, I'm not going to want to play in any games there. I will say Honor Among Thieves was strongest in its action and comedy elements. On the comedy, w without any spoilers, it got some genuine laughs out of me with the dragon encounter and its portrayal of Speak With Dead. I laughed at how they portrayed halflings, which reminded me of the aesthetic in the Neverwinter Nights games, which is halflings are the same proportions as humans, but literally half the size. It's goofy, and honestly, it contributes to that fake feeling of the setting, but I still laughed. The paladin character was a nod to the lawful stupid trope, and that experience of playing with an overzealous role player at the table D&D veterans have all had. But that said, I still felt like it was a middling comedy at best. Now concerning the action sequences. Here the movie was genuinely good, but I still have some quibbles. A standout sequence for me was when Doric the Druid fled through Neverwinter, wild shaping constantly. That was cool. My quibble is that combat sequences didn't express the characters well, and I think it is especially important for a D&D movie that they do that. Take, for example, the Paladin's fight sequence in the Underdark. It was cool, and it established that he was powerful, but that was all the choreography said, and it would have been better if it told us more. For example, does he fight with discipline or with wild emotion? Is he calculated or instinctual? Does his power come mostly from his magical equipment? He wears armor, right? Okay, show him fighting in a way that utilizes that armor rather than dodging every attack. I would think given his class and backstory, his technique should try to demonstrate a mix of practice discipline with holy wrath. These are the things combat sequences should be considering, and as a rule in this movie, they did not. There were two areas where I was just genuinely delighted, though, so I'll list them now. First, I thought Sophia, wait, I mean Safina, and the aesthetic of the Red Wizards of Fae was spectacular. It 100% works in the movie, and it makes me kind of excited to see what else directors can do with them in the future. Second, when the main cast used pre-established mechanics to solve problems in the movie, 
I have two examples in mind here. The first was the Hither Thither Heist, and the second was Doric's Escape to the Gelatinous Cube. Both of those were creative and seemed exactly like the kind of thing my D&D players would actually do and that I as a DM would actually allow, so bravo there to the writers. In summary, it was a competent movie in a lot of ways well done, and for many D&D fans, that may seem like good enough given Hollywood's track record in this IP. I think we ought to expect more though, so I'll end my monologue just by describing the potential I think a D&D movie can have. If you've played D&D before, I am certain you've had the experience of reading a book, seeing a piece of concept art, or watching an anime that inspired an idea for a campaign or character. If you're like me, those ideas hook into your brain, usually for weeks, and you're practically compelled to grab a player's handbook and start rolling up a character or plan out an encounter, even when you don't have friends to play with. For example, when Peter Jackson's The Fellowship of the Rings first dropped, me and my friends were already months into a campaign, but we all agreed we wanted to be playing in Middle-earth instead. The very next session, our characters were magically teleported into the Council of Elrond, where our DM initiated an elaborate, parallel plot, which put our crew directly into the events of the movie. We played in our own hackneyed version of Middle Earth every week for the next year straight and roped two other friends in with us who before that movie probably wouldn't have given D&D a second glance. That is what D&D Honor Among Thieves could have done, but to be that kind of movie it would have to be cool, and while it was many good things, it wasn't cool. So that's my monologue, and I'm just calling our guests now to get into the interview. So again, if you're worried about spoilers, just stop the video here. All right, we're joined now by our special guest. This is Thaddeus. Thaddeus, why don't you say hello? Hey there, everybody. So you and I go way back. Um, We grew up in the same town. We went to the same schools. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to return the sentiment. I don't want to get sappy or anything, but... I do consider you like a brother. Well, um, not sure how to take that, but okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> this just got real awkward reason, real fast, man. So, uh, we used to play Dungeons and Dragons together. And, mm-hmm. um, but you kind of got out of the hobby. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I played D&D for the first time when I was four years old. Um, I, it's always been a part of my life. I've always had a working knowledge of it, but I, um, I enjoyed playing it for the social aspect of it, um, right. and, uh, never was super into the system, and, uh, over time, other social, um, hobbies kind of took more and more of my time and uh yeah it's been a while since i've really gotten into a D campaign right which is perfect for me that's you know the big reason why i want your opinion on this movie is one uh i talk to you about every movie <laughs> we talk about movies a lot uh and i can't imagine mm-hmm. making a video talking about a movie without having your opinion on it but also i think you have a really interesting take on this one because, you know, I am a D&D fan reviewing this movie. I want to get the take of someone who knows about D&D, but isn't really a D&D player anymore. So that's kind of the perspective I am super interested in, in hearing your opinions of. Yeah, for sure. And I think uh, it's fair to say one of the hobbies that I uh, pursued after D&D is, is film. <laughs> and uh, not in any sort of like... Uh, professional way or anything like that but it's for the last like 16 years of my life film criticism and uh, just the general overall enjoyment in film culture has been a big part of my life but of course I still hold a special place in my heart for (laughs) (laughs) D&D of course yeah actually um, just for deep lore for fans of the the channel 
uh, Thaddeus and I actually had a podcast together where we talked about movies. It was just a movie podcast. I didn't talk about D&D or CRPGs or anything like that. And we recorded at least a half a dozen episodes, I'd say, but we never released a single one. <laughs> yeah, and that that's on me. <laughs> <laughs> honestly i wasn't expecting it was just something fun to do it was right when covid started if i'm remembering right so um yeah it was just a blast to do but yeah it was around that so, time it was a lot of fun uh, but you're the one who actually you know went out and started making things and publishing things i uh <laughs> i never got that far <laughs> yeah well we'll see um so yes uh you are a Someone who's super into film and not super into D and D, although you know about it. So let's just get into Dungeons and Dragons: Honor Among Thieves. What is your general like impression of the movie? Did you like it? Yeah, um, I'll come in saying I believe this is above average popcorn fare. I had a I had a great time with it. Um, I watched it with another person who also had a great time with it, and we don't always agree on um, on things. I think it's the first film outside of the Marvel Cinematic Universe to kind of take the Marvel formula and do something uh, like a pretty solid, honestly, I would say better in a lot of ways, version of it. Um, which really? I know in certain ways, in certain ways, not, not, not in every way, but in some ways that I think Marvel, especially in the last few years, has really been dropping the ball. Uh, this movie picked up that ball and, uh, ran with it in some really impressive ways. I felt, um, in some ways you can feel like, okay, this is what they were trying. So it's almost like a facsimile. Like you can, you can chart these characters, not exactly one to one, but almost one to one onto the Guardians of the Galaxy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and that that really feels like what they were trying to go for. But I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy is a pretty solid Marvel flick, and if you're going to copy something, and you copy it pretty well, <laughs> like uh, and also improve on certain aspects, uh, I think yeah, I, I had I had a I had a great time. Um, it made me. Um, it made me excited about the concept moving forward. I think there are uh, D and D specific. Obviously, there's D and D specific references, but I mean references are just like Easter eggs. They don't really necessarily affect the quality of the movie. But I think there's some really. Um, imp I think there's some impressive uh, D and D DNA that weave into this film honestly i'm really thinking about one example which we can get into but yeah i, well, I had a great example? time uh the example that i have is um Regé jean page as the paladin character and okay. how they're able to which like the thing about the marvel formula 95 percent of marvel success comes from their casting uh marvel is I mean, obviously they they've done good things with long form storytelling, but most of their movies have some pretty basic flaws. Um, they're still great. They, they're but the reason why they're extremely great and watchable is because they cast really charming people in really fun roles. That's like, in my opinion, ninety five mm -hmm. percent of their success. And this movie did that well. Uh, and uh, with the center point being Chris Pine. But Regé Jean Page is the paladin. Having him bring, being able to bring out legitimate humor from a person just playing what the role of the paladin is, you know, like his introduction of walking up and and pulling this baby out of the like <laughs> out of the giant fish's mouth and handing it while his like robe is parted open and you can see his glistening pectorals. Like it was just. The way that they were able to both have, like, this is, if you have somebody who's committed to the role play of saying, like, I am going to play a paladin the way it should be played, and then for that to 
to, for that to for them to never fudge on that, but then also bring like legitimately great humor onto it was, in my opinion, one of the most in, inspired part of of the whole movie. But yeah, um, you know, I in the monologue I just gave, I brought up the paladin as a part of the comedy that I thought worked really well. I agree, but to me, uh, it it seemed like he was playing a bad role player playing a paladin. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Um, I see it as a pretty... Um, which, speaking of, I think the one aspect of the Paladin character is they almost took directly Drax's bit from Guardians of the Galaxy where he you know, he takes things literally. Right. They, yeah. they just transplanted that bit onto the Paladin, and they have all these jokes where he just doesn't understand what they're saying because he's taking everything they're saying literally but there was other aspects of his humor that it uh, worked really well i think it is yeah it, it feels like somebody who is role playing this role of a paladin and you know marvel gets a lot of joke it gets a lot of uh stuff thrown at it because it can be a little bit too winking and it can be a little bit too mm -hmm. like hey we know this is a movie we're gonna comment on it and this movie does some of that but they didn't do it with the paladin the paladin is funny because of how committed he is to being a, pa a paladin right. you know yeah and that's you can have a lot of fun in D D when somebody is committed to actually you know playing the role and not just um playing a facsimile of themselves or making jokes about, I don't know, modern day things in the fantasy world. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I think with that character, uh, I see... That character was the clearest example that I could see of it looking like this was played at a table, if you know what I mean. Like, um, yeah. Like you're saying, the, the Drax copy joke, you know, where these references and the metaphors they go over his head so to speak mm -hmm. um to me that's like i i swear i've even had people i've played D, D with uh make jokes like that as an interpretation of a character that rolled low on intelligence yeah yeah absolutely um it's this the paladin character well, I mean, he's both intelligent. Maybe I, I don't. I don't know. It, it, it's it's a really inspired performance, and I was really impressed, honestly, because I uh, didn't know Reggie Jean Page from from pretty much anything. Like, I, I didn't watch Bridgerton, um, and I watched him on one episode of SNL, and he was he was funny on SNL, but uh, I hadn't really seen him in much else. So for him to kind of come in, and in my opinion, like not entirely steal the movie but be like the the high point uh it all also honestly kind of feels like whenever you invite somebody over who brings their own character who's a way higher level than the rest of the party you right, know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the, like he's just he's just he's just slaying dragons like it's nothing and guiding them through all these things like somebody came over who takes D, &D extremely seriously he knows his character he's going to play him right and he's a way higher level than the rest of the party and so after a while he's just like you know what i'm gonna go on my own adventure he he literally played for like one night of the campaign and then and then he left you know yeah, yeah. some guy invited brought him back from college and who the, the guy who plays the paladin in my opinion has his own set of dice you know that's uh that he got <laughs> like special made <laughs> yeah 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 so i agree i think um it, it's interesting to me that that character was a standout for you because yeah i mentioned it as well i think that was uh a a standout part of the movie um I wonder, though, do you have many memories of the Forgotten Realms? Do you even know what, I, what I'm talking about when I say Forgotten Realms? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Forgotten Realms is a is a world. It's a geography of the... I mean, it's just the classic D&D &D campaigns were set in the Forgotten Realms, I, I believe, right? It's a... Uh, I mean, there's obviously there's also a book series... Um, mm -hmm. and anything set in the Forgotten yeah. Realms. Yeah, that's um, pretty much right. It's it's like an intellectual property that... Um, Wizards the, of the Coast, right? Or no? Yeah, Wizards of the Coast owns it. It came with... Um, originally, TSR owned it, but it was it was built as a specifically 
Dungeons and Dragons setting in the second edition era, if I'm remembering right, whenever they did a lot of setting work. Um, mm-hmm. But it kind of became a standout setting because of a book series and a video game series. So with the video game series, it was Baldur's Gate, a game I know you played a bit when you were younger yeah. and probably most, haven't played since you were like 10 years old or something. <laughs> yeah, most of my... I spent a lot of my childhood uh, watching people play Baldur's Gate. Uh, <laughs> being the youngest of the friend group, uh, I did not know how to have my own interests and everybody else was interested in Baldur's Gate, so uh, I had a great time watching people play it. I, I would never get past... I would make like one character and uh, never really make it past the first town. But I know the lore. I, I remember Minsk. I remember it all. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, when I talked about uh, Easter eggs, I mean, the film just like blatantly saying like, you know, Bald- saying Baldur's Gate, talking about going to Neverwinter, like setting it inside the the geography of the games and the and the worlds that the forgotten realms what we grew up playing right yeah okay so you do have yeah you remember a bit about the forgotten realms now i think the forgotten realms in this movie and i just said this in my monologue i think it's a little bit more important than just references so let me just tell Mm -hmm. you my take on this um so I, I, my general take on this movie, I feel like I enjoyed it, but I was still very disappointed, probably because I expect a lot from a Dungeons and Dragons movie as someone who's in the hobby. Um, yeah, yeah. And to me, what a Dungeons and Dragons movie should do is inspire people to want to play Dungeons and Dragons and to get into Dungeons and Dragons IP. Right, like that's that's kind of the point of the movie, um, and that's you know that might sound like is this like some kind of cynical ad, but to me it's not cynical at all because I feel like there's always been a kind of let's say a synergy between uh, role playing games and established movies and and books, you know, story media, because. Mm-hmm. The, the hobby of Dungeons and Dragons is you making your own stories, and everyone has always made their Dungeons and Dragons stories by stealing the, their favorite ideas from books and movies. In, in a way, yeah. a lot of the fun of D&D is playing those characters yourself. You know, it's like, I'm going to be Aragorn in this adventure. And actually, I know uh, when we were kids, we played together a... Um, a, a year-long campaign set in Middle Earth back when the Fellowship of the Rings first dropped. I actually just mentioned that in my monologue. Do you remember that? I don't. I don't remember Lord of the Rings. I remember Warcraft. We did. We did a long campaign in the Warcraft world. But yeah, um, we did. But we also, man, I can't. Be, I can't believe you don't remember this. Uh, we played um, when the Fellowship came out. We played. It, we were already playing a campaign, and then our DM, you will remember him, he transported us into the Council of Elrond, where we played out a long campaign where our party, our D&D party, was a decoy that was supposed <laughs> to distract away from the actual the Fellowship, right? And yeah, no, the I can, fellowship I can see goes, our DM being like, nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I no, we were all so psyched, man. I remember this like it was yesterday. And the the original setup was I won't go into too much of a tangent, but the original setup was that so the fellowship goes over the mountains, right? But yeah. um, and our group, the decoy, goes under the mountains through Moria, but. That, uh, that was the original plan. But then, of course, in the, the plot of the movie, they the actual Fellowship gets, like, detoured, and they're forced to go into Moria, too. And so, like, we played a while, like, in Moria, exploring it, and then we end up, like, joining up with the Fellowship. Anyways, it, it doesn't matter. But, um... Where was I going with this? Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm saying that there's, like, um... 
that you know that experience like we watched that movie and it was so cool we had to play in middle earth right and yeah it's not like an ad thing it, that's just part of the like pure experience of role-playing games to me and i feel like what one of the things this movie needed to pull off was that the forgotten realms had to be cool and it had to mm-hmm. like draw you in and make you want to play in it and for me this setting it was all fairly realms, generic and, yeah in this in this edition of it, it has never been more fake. It just did not feel like a real world. Did it feel like a real world to you? Okay, well, this is... We might we might have a, some differences of opinion. Um, I think that they did not succeed in maybe establishing... the. It depends on what you mean by real. Because, like... In the sense of it feeling like a lived-in place, I, I think mm-hmm. that all the places that they visited were, were fairly generic, right? And they also traveled back and forth to many different places very quickly, um, which can make the reality of a, a quest not feel real. There's a reason why Lord of the Rings feels like a journey. And, I mean, it's not just that it's nine hours long. It's because you see them travel and it takes a long time for them to get places, you know? Um, right. And this movie, they bounce back and forth and it, it all feels like it takes place in like a week, you know, um, which can really hurt the reality there. So I, I, I get it from that point, but one of the things I would praise this movie about and why, what I was saying, it does better than, marvel in a lot of ways is and i mean look i don't want to get into a whole cgi practical which is better they're both amazing they need to be used in tangent uh this movie of course uses them in tangent but like i was just so thankful to see a movie on sets um (laughs) that and also actually out on landscapes there were several shots where i'm like the only way they could have filmed this i mean not the only way i mean obviously james cameron can (laughs) can build his build his pandora and do whatever he wants but it really feels like to me they actually just went to cool locations and filmed them filmed filmed them riding on horses filmed them like i follow the director of this movie on um on twitter and there were several i mean now i'm getting more into the special effects side of things but there were several effects that they just did in camera like the quicksand the transmute stone to quicksand you know uh that was a completely practical effect. They actually sunk down into the ground that way. Um, they, because Marvel for the last like six years or so, for the most part, has filmed the majority of their movies on parking lots in Atlanta. <laughs> and look, movies that I love, <laughs> that I think are great, but they filmed them in Atlanta, and they ever like the whole background is just all CGI all the time. They often. Uh, they often don't have characters in the same place at the same time, and they pair them together because they'll film one person here, one person there. It's all very, like, um, it can feel like very non-tactile cinema. And I felt that the movie itself felt very tactile. I could agree that the world, they didn't do a great job of establishing, giving it, giving it personality, giving it a, a soul, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, definitely the locations look real, but actually, uh, and, you know, I agree with you. I also got the impression that they were going places. And In fact, you can just see <laughs> at, at one point in the third act when um, there is actually, in this section, it's okay to have spoilers. So, you know, there's the, the big event in the Coliseum. And meanwhile, yeah. uh, there's like a side thing going on just outside the the Coliseum with the boat and there's that the yeah. conflict between Forge and um oh, what's Chris Pine's character's name again uh I have it here uh, Edgen that's not a good e- Edgen maybe Edgen Ed, yeah something like that anyways I don't know this we'll is not this is not a good sign because I mean Chris <laughs> Pratt is great in this movie but he's he's playing Chris Pratt you know so wait wait you Chris just think Pratt's of it as Chris movie? Pratt. Oh, sorry, not Pratt. Pine. 
Pine, my bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, uh, I know what you're saying. I just had to... <laughs> Okay, but literally, um, he's he's the Star Lord role, so you just get a different Chris P. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, so in in one of the scenes, um, there's a shot, and now I'm almost second guessing myself here, but at the time, I swear I saw this that there's a shot of Forge, and over his shoulder is the Colosseum, the Neverwinter Colosseum, except. In this shot, it is not the Neverwinter Coliseum. It's the Coliseum in Rome. Like, huh. they, it's just the, the they're in Rome. It's like apparently Neverwinter is Rome. And I mean, cool that they're there, but it's like this doesn't this doesn't feel like the Forgotten Realms, you know? Yeah, I I didn't notice that. Um, but there's there's a part of me that just like yeah, I mean, I appreciate location shooting. I appreciate. Um, real sets real um effort into the into the the character design and also like the the practical effects of like uh I, like Jonathan you know Jonathan that was that was a suit you know <laughs> that wasn't yeah, that yeah, wasn't yeah. a CGI character that was that was <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah of course and actually I love those suits they did that with the Aracogra and the Tabaxi which the Aarakocra yeah. are the bird people and the Tabaxi are the cat people, and um, <laughs> man, I just love those those suits. Actually, like it felt like um, oh, it felt like the eighties to me. Is that right? Um, on I mean, there's definitely some really great um, character design work in the eighties. I mean, the one the 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 biggest name in and and some people might. But anyway, the biggest name, in my opinion, in, like, character design is Rick Baker, and, like, his masterpieces, I mean, he's got a lot of masterpieces, but he did the original Men in Black movies, you know, and, like, how uh, all, okay, yeah. all of those aliens in Men in Black are, are practical, you know? Um, gotcha. Well, okay, they, 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 like, they blended them, but a lot of them are true blue, practical, and it's just amazing uh, character work, you know, and it felt like this. Yeah, yeah. This was not Rick Baker, but it's in that. It's in that tradition of just like let's actually just make an amazing looking practical character, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I did like that part of it. I gotta say. Um, we talked about the Forgotten Realms. The other thing I wanted to get your take on. I talked about this in my monologue was um, combat. Let's talk about the combat sequences. Because, okay. and so I'll just tell you where I'm going with this. Um, I feel like another really important thing about Dungeons & Dragons movies is that they express character in combat. Um, do you know what I mean when I say that? <laughs> or should I give some examples? No, I mean, I, I understand. Uh, I mean, let's use Lord of the Rings. I mean, a really maybe over the top example is you see Legolas literally skateboarding downstairs while shooting <laughs> uh, sh while shooting characters versus uh, um, I don't know Gimli or I don't know being willing to be tossed onto the bridge or like how characters fight what what you don't want to see is to have a, a, a character fight in a way that is opposed to who their character is or I guess you're saying it's just kind of bland and doesn't actually reveal anything about their yeah. characters? Yeah, well, yeah, that's more of what I think this movie, its problem is. It's, it, it felt like it didn't even occur to them to express character through combat. So the the example I give in my monologue is actually the paladin fight in the Underdark. You know which one I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, with the uh, with the red mage assassins yes. or fighters. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and um, now it's actually a very cool fight sequence, and and I will say like the combat sequences in this movie were very, uh, they were well done. They were very competent. Yeah. I just feel like well they were shot. ambitious. Yeah, I think they were well shot. I think extremely well performed. Once again, Reggie Jean Page kind of kind of stole the show in my opinion of like very clearly him doing that sword work. You know, like um, yeah. not that stunt people, some people are amazing and should be used. But, like, it's cool when you see the actor very believably doing the combat, you know? 
Yeah, um, yeah, that's definitely what you want. I, I'm, I'm thinking, and I mean, I think I can point to certain scenes where, I mean, I would argue that the, that the combat scene of they're about to get executed, where, um, right, you know, yeah. Michelle Rodriguez's character, I forget once again, I'm forgetting the characters' names, but Michelle Rodriguez and Chris Pine are about to get executed, and we have. Her, you know, as the barbarian, like, just Mm -hmm. going to town in anger at all these guys and just taking them all down while Chris Pine's, you know, trying to saw his uh, his, uh, ropes off. I feel like that was a pretty solid... Um, communication of character but i'm 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 just playing devil's advocate (laughs) yeah yeah, no actually i completely agree i think with her character um she had two major fight sequences at least that i can remember there's that one and there's the one at the end where her axe gets dipped in the the you know molten molten steel yeah. (laughs) yeah, yeah 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 um uh both of those i think yeah, those work, but I think it's almost by accident because there isn't much to her character except that, you know, she's savage. Um, she, you know, she's a barbarian. She's really just a barbarian, right? Um, yeah. With the paladin character, you know, there's there's a lot in his character that's pretty interesting that you can express through combat. So, for example, he is a Thean, right? Um, yeah. But he, he's also a paladin. So they should be asking questions like, is this character th- does this character fight mostly on instinct or is it you know really rigorous uh calculated training or is it discipline and and what i think they should try to portray really simply is a combination of discipline but also holy wrath right mm-hmm. there's yeah and it it just wasn't there <laughs> yeah they, and there's how, also how the equipment John- angle sorry go ahead well, I was just like, how Reggie Jean Page played the character is just extremely unflappable. Um, and right. that carries That's through true. to yeah. his combat, where he's just extremely calm and just very precise, I would say, um, in his takedown of um, of the characters. But anyways, continue. Uh, I'm just thinking about what you said. Yeah, I mean, I guess, but like, they... I, I yeah I really feel like they can do more with the character. I mean he's a he's a Thean paladin. Like there's this whole setup where he's like, uh, you know the the red wizards of Thay are the bad guys. And and by yeah. the way, and you can just tell me your opinion. The the red wizards with you know the bald head <laughs> and the red robes that totally worked, didn't it? <laughs> I mean it's it's pretty just shorthand but it establishes like hey anybody who looks like this is the villain um and i mean i don't know i d- it didn't stand out to me but it also didn't like i didn't think anything of it I, it worked yeah man i i really liked it i mean that's something that goes back like way back into the 90s red wizards have always kind of looked like that and then seeing it on a screen and to me it really like to me it really looked cool i thought they looked cool but um yeah you know like he's one of the bad guys but He's, he's found redemption, and it feels like there's an angle there, and they just missed it. And in general, like, okay, so you have a wild mage. Like, the sorcerer is a wild mage sorcerer, which is a specific subclass that has rules in the player's handbook, right? And yeah. besides the one very cool, like, gravity trick he accidentally pulls off in the theater when they fir- first introduce him, the fact that he's yeah. a wild mage never comes up again. And yeah, I I don't know. To me, it really missed opportunity there. Yeah, I could see that. I feel like they did solid once again. I think that everybody is cast really well. Um, I've I know I kind of said Chris Pine's playing Chris Pine, but uh, that's not nothing. <laughs> Chris Pine yeah. might be the most charismatic. I think he's the most charismatic of all the Chris's um, of all the Hollywood <laughs> Chris's. Um, do you disagree? I, I don't have a hard opinion on it, but it, that just sounds controversial to me. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, n- I'm not saying he's like the best at everything, but just pure charisma, I would go with Pine. Um, but anyways, and I feel like the guy who... They, they did a pretty solid arc with the wizard character, I feel. And you, know, you and I have different opinions on arcs. Um, but uh, to kind of 
establish that you know he's going on his own journey uh but he's also kind of a minor part of this so his arc's pretty simple but okay we we real real quick we should do a drive-by if i'm talking performances hugh grant man when you give right, Hugh Grant yeah. the chance to 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 be a ridiculous little fop, you know, and it's just the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I um, I was I was thinking of going through the performances, and maybe if we have time at the end, we can we can go through the ones. Okay, but sorry, yeah, I, 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 I felt like you're... no, go ahead. I swear, you were talking about character through um, combat, and I mean, I could I could point to certain things, but made this like you said that basically just did that with the barbarian. Uh, I could see how that um, how that could be something that is wanting, but actually, we should also take the time. I I already cut you off, and I wanted to let you continue, but I actually do think there are some pretty impressive visual set pieces in this, and I do want to talk about you- them. But you go. Well, yeah, let's get into it. Because I, I ta- actually, I said all my these opinions in my monologue, so I'm just kind of going over them and getting your... Okay. I mean, okay, if we're going to talk about, if we're going to talk about set pieces, I think that, which I, I've decided we are, I guess. Um, yeah, let's do the it. Other thing, the other thing that this movie did that Marvel has not done in a long time, and um, it's really, really impressive to see, which is to really put thoughts into their visual storytelling of how how are we shooting these things and i think as somebody who grew up as a casual movie fan who only cared about character and story which is fine i feel like 98 percent of people who watch movies only think about character and story and don't actually think about how the camera is moving um yeah i i'm probably so, one of those in the 98 but yeah so it but, which is which is fine but the the, the way there there's some really impressive like the whole kind of heist sequence where they um where you know they put the hither thither staff portal inside the the lockbox yeah. that's going to be delivered yeah that is yeah. like I, you know i knew when i was watching that that you would like that oh uh, man it's like top notch like for one thing once again i follow the directors on twitter and so they showed like how they had to build out fake walls to be able to like cuz it it's a square on the inside right but to film it you have to, from from multiple angles they would do a thing where like literally the walls would move out of the way so they can film it and then when the camera would move to the other side and that wall would come back into place you know which was all done practically right. which is just like extremely yeah, impressive yeah i thought of that um, extremely impressive, like visual thinking and storytelling. Uh, and then, I mean, we've all played Portal. Um, there's so much fun <laughs> things that can be done with Portal, and to have it be like once again, they set up, they set up the rules. Um, storytelling, especially visual storytelling, but all storytelling is set up in payoffs, right? And mm-hmm. By the time that high sequence starts, you know what the rules are, you get what they're doing, but also not exactly how they're, you're discovering how they're doing it as they do it. Uh, there's comp- complications, but like the fact that like part of the distraction of why they don't get caught is them up on the hill and there's just the sight gag of Michelle Rodriguez like, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. like yeah, yeah you, you know what was going there but that's also the thing that's distracting them from like being right in front. uh it's it's extremely impressive um work and, and that's like that's visual thinking and storytelling and that's a, an amazing like a really well done set piece that's well thought through and i think Marvel, especially the last six years or so, has gotten into... And once again, I say all this, I'm actually a big Marvel fan. I I think they succeed way more than they fail. But it can turn into CGI characters punching other CGI characters, you know? Um, to To have, like, ideas that are executed through the cut and through the edit and through the planning of it, it's just... is a really good to see the other one i thought now and this is cgi but it's still well thought through visually is the scene where you know they escape the coliseum through the gelatinous cube yeah um, i brought up both of those though i knew you'd like those yeah tell tell us well, about it. It, it well the druid like for one once again it's established we've already seen what happens to people in the gelatinous cube we already know that this druid can shapeshift into different animals right we've seen mm-hmm. sh- 
set up and payoffs. We've established whenever she was the one that was put, um, she did break through um, the mirror, even though that plan failed. And she's like, wait a second, I'm not in this place. I'm I'm below the Colosseum. And so they've established, yep. she, she recognizes, she's below the Colosseum, she knows where these b- bricks are going, and so it's all pieced together so well, they jump into the gelatinous cube, with her finger out, and you're like, change into a snake, get out. I'm just explaining what happens, but it's all, <laughs> it, was it all cool. makes sense, it's all set up, it shows intelligence, it shows, like, it's not like... There's, uh, you know, there's the term deus ex machina, which um, can be thrown around a lot, but it's basically where the solution to the problem is something that was ne- not set up. It's the mach- mach- the machinations of the gods, like something just appears at the end to save them. Like right. none of the ways that they did these things, like they were all set up, they made sense, they, they made sense to the character. And um, uh, anyways, just those, those are the two honestly, pieces of visual storytelling. You go. Yeah, and both of them work in a D and D movie, and it, you know that's the perspective that I'm I'm really taking here. What is a D and D movie? And this is something you and I have talked about in the past. And honestly, they this is what impressed me the most about the movie, even though ultimately I was disappointed, was that they gave me an authentic vision of D and D that I recognize as like, oh yeah, that is super D and D. But it wasn't something yes. that I thought of, and that is the the heist logic. <laughs> All of those little, the pr- particularly those two things, those are things well, I can see my players think of, and me as a DM being like, "Yeah, that's cool. That happens now." You know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like you could see somebody while you're playing, while you're playing. Like if you set up the Coliseum as part of your campaign, right? Um, mm-hmm. and you think that they're going to battle to the end and get to the gate. You know, that's your plan. You could see somebody being like, where are these bricks going? There's a gelatinous cube. Like, there's always that player who's trying to kind of break the rules or, like, not not literally break the D&D rules, but break the rules of what the campaign is, you know? Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, Every single D and D campaign has done some sort of heist, you know, because it's a perfect D and D campaign. It's like how you got to break in and find something out or plant something somewhere. So, I mean, uh, I think they absolutely they both work as um, they both work as D and D. Another one that I thought. Now I'm interested. I have I have a suspicion that you that you are not that there that you didn't like this. Okay, but. I, I liked it, and I wanted to bring it up. Okay, the scene where they're using the the illusion of Chris Pine singing as a bard, as a distraction, right. and then the mage... The thing I, I suspect you maybe didn't like is when the mage gets his foot stuck, and then they just go, like, so over the top with how the illusion just, like, breaks down, right? Um, and I mean, it, it's hilarious, like busting out laughing, but it felt like the most, like, this is, this is less D and D and more just like somebody on, like literally like on CG Photoshop, just like bugging the eyes and what, what it used to be when we would like Photoshop, like uh, one of our friends into looking like a hobbit, you know, like <laughs> right. it yeah. was, uh, uh, so, but that scene of like. Of course, somebody would be like, well, I'll just cast an illusion and use a distraction to get in there. And then somebody would would fail the dice roll. You know, that's what it read like read like to me, you know, that it it was a good idea. But somebody failed the dice roll. (laughs) More specifically, actually, and uh, you wouldn't be familiar with this because you only uh, you stop playing after, I think, uh, third edition. I don't think you made it past third edition. Um but in new editions of D&D, there is a concentration mechanic where if you are focusing on a spell and something happens to break your concentration, the spell will fail. And, gotcha. Um, so they, they literally just set it up then that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it kind of functions like that. Like, you can you could definitely read it that way. And uh, But, you know, like, I didn't really come in to watch this movie expecting a faithful representation of the D&D rules because, I mean... There really isn't, uh, like, you know, DMs change the rules at their table. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. you know, one of the 
biggest reasons why you would change the rule at your table is because it's cool and funny to do it. Right? That's what, you know, that's what you're trying to get from the game. So if someone has something funny that would happen and it doesn't fit the rules, well, you change the rules to make the funny thing happen. And so, yeah, no, I actually did like that scene. I got a good laugh out of it. I thought it was... Okay, good. It was, Hardest it was laugh of the whole enough. movie, in my opinion. Like, I, it didn't impress that me as much, one, but like... Part? Oh, yeah. Dying. Me and the person uh, I saw it with were just like rolling in our seats. Like, it was... Man. It was. I laughed. I laughed at the fat dragon. That was. That was oh, what yeah, got no. me. <laughs> <laughs> it was so cute too. He found. He must have found a new den. Did he eat the other one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, um, was, that was pretty good. Uh, because you yeah, know the movie it, had to have a dragon, right? But yeah, yeah. They just they made could, it fat. Because why not? You could tell it's just like, well, this is Dungeons and Dragons. We have to have a dragon. But how can we just not have it be, like? discount smog you know so it was right. just yeah. and you could just you could totally see a dm coming up with that too you know like that feels like somebody like a more wacky dm being like so the dragon's like you know obese <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 no, yeah i mean honestly i was i was like man i should have thought of that and however you know the decades i've been running D, why haven't i made one of the dragons super fat <laughs> Yeah. Um, what did you think of the speak with dead um, sequence? Oh, uh, just, uh, I mean, it worked for me, you know? Like, it, it's just classic. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty good. It was comedy. Good, yeah. Like, it, it's it's honestly like, like almost like Abbott Costello or British humor, like who's on first. Like, that, that opening scene <laughs> of them asking questions and the questions go wrong. It's, it's just smart. I mean, it's just classic writing um that but then like each one like each one was a different joke you know the first one was the who's on first of like it's like why did you ask it why did you add why to the end of that question he's like i didn't and then he dies right <laughs> um yeah like if all five of those work um but then like the next one being like well this guy just like died the morning of by slipping on the bathtub you know <laughs> like, yeah, yeah um all of that i mean it was just it was just a funny sequence like this movie the comedy succeeded in this movie um i would say and yeah, i felt that know, that sequence was really smart i'm feeling better about the comedy now that i'm talking to you about it because there are a lot of funny moments um mm-hmm. but honestly like when i left that theater i thought there were some funny jokes but it was still kind of a middling comedy to me. So maybe I was just in a really downer mood. But uh, it wasn't Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, like, I laughed way more at Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, see, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I feel like, I, I feel like it was just real solid comedy all the way throughout. That that A lot of that comes from casting. Um I mean, from the beginning, like, the moment where, you know, they, Jonathan finally shows up, and they do their heist attempt, and then the guy's just like, but we just approved your, <laughs> we just approved your parole, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I like just... that joke, but I was also yeah. triggered a little bit that they they were having a parole hearing. I mean, they call it a pardon hearing. Maybe that yeah. medievalizes it a little bit, but it's like... Why is there a parole hearing in the Forgotten Realms? Like, <sighs> the joke was fun. I don't know, but yeah, <laughs> and, and the fact, like, I don't know. It, um, it's. I, I think I think the comedy worked. I think uh, Hugh Grant was really funny. Um, Chris Pine was really funny. Regé Jean Page. St- the the scene where he's walking away and there's like oh no wait there's a rock what's he gonna do is he gonna yeah, go around yeah. nope straight over <laughs> that one was good all, all of the paladin jokes were pretty good I yeah, yeah. but we talked about that um, yeah, that yeah. Was kind anyways of uh comedy worked all the way throughout for me the um so yeah uh to me the only other thing that's like that I feel like is worth talking about and I don't know necessarily how it connects to D and D but just like the root baseline emotional story that it told and whether it worked right. or not. Yeah, let's talk about that. What did you think about that? Um I would say for a popcorn movie, uh I'd put it at I don't know, it pretty much right down the middle. There's aspects of it that worked really well. Um 
I once again set up in payoffs because so many, so many movies just like don't know how to set up and pay off. It's like the basic, it's the basics of storytelling. And I can't, it's because most, a lot of modern movies and especially Marvel movies are being rewritten constantly. And it's hard to really set up and pay off something if you don't have a finished script. And these directors were screenwriters first, and I think that shows. I think it shows that they had a pretty strong screenplay. It's not the end-all, be-all. Uh, to me, there's two major ways that they drop the ball. Um, that being said, this movie did make me cry. Um, that's not <laughs> that's not difficult for me, but they, they hit a really strong idea that was powerful, and they shot themselves in the foot immediately afterwards. So... Um, do you mind if I just run down what the, what I think this is? No, please do. I'm interested. Okay. So, first of all, so the baseline of the emotional storytelling is can, can this guy overcome his selfishness to do the right thing for his daughter that might not be the right thing for him? Um, and they set that up throughout the film with the symbolism of the dragonfly, um, the establishing of what his wife taught him is sometimes... Instead of fighting, you just have to let things go. Like, these are all set up payoffs for that moment, right? And they, I think they set it up really well. Um, I think they they did a thing, that, this is an aside, but, like, every single dead wife movie always has to have a scene where the w- wife is, like, hiding under white sheets in their bed. Uh, no, like, I know. I know, <laughs> but this one, I feel like they... So I was like, why are they doing this again? But then they kind of... They kind of did a twist on it where they were there because they were hiding from the dragonfly. They actually, like, grounded it as opposed to this is just, like, some random daydream or whatever. But anyways. <laughs> you know, so the re- every day, though, I check my memories to see if I have a memory of my wife where she's under white sheets. And I don't. And that means you- she'll never die. Yeah, I mean, I just realized I don't have that either, so... Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, either <laughs> she'll never hack. die. Life or, hack for you guys. Either she'll never die, or if she does die, I will never be able to truly remember her. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, that's. Dumb. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, but anyways, I trust you. So Keep here's, going. here's the thing, and it all comes to the moment where it does something that I didn't suspect, that totally makes sense, and and works, that hits like a hammer, which is the moment where. The barbarian character is dying in front of his daughter, and um, he realizes that his daughter's mother is his best friend. Is this barbarian's character? It's not. I should really remember their names. Um, it's it's not <laughs> what his daughter needs more than himself. He wants his wife back, but right now, since the the barbarian has died. What's more important to his daughter is to bring her back as opposed to his wife. And when it's showing all the scenes of this, his best friend being a mother to his daughter, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It makes sense. It, once again, is set up. They establish that. Um, and But then, immediately afterwards, they double beat it and they drive it home. Like they, they Like, they show you it perfectly and then they, like, spell it out for you very clumsily it's like you guys had a masterpiece but then like the daughter looks up and sees it sees him holding it and she's just like yes and he's like i can only use it once and we're like yeah no we get it okay we you already you already you did it already it worked we're we're crying and you're just like spelling it like here you're like basically doing the airplane to a baby because it's like here's here's the point of the movie and it's like oh you guys had it you you did it and then i'm sure it's some studio executive came in and it's just like make sure they say that they can't use it again because studio executives are <laughs> right dumb. yeah of course um, so, um, I will say that's the biggest thing that failed in terms of the storytelling. The other moment that failed that just really rang false and also really hurt the stakes of the movie is when after they've been in prison for two years, they come back and they see the daughter and they play the fact that like the daughter's really angry at him as if it's just like awkward, right? 
Right. Like yep. the daughter runs up and hugs the barbarian and like her mom basically, and they have an emotional storytelling there. And instead of it being like the dad expecting nothing to have changed and like trying to hug his daughter and her her, her like pushing him away or any sort of thing that felt like the, a legitimate thing that would happen, they just kind of have it be awkward. And I'm like, there's no world where this guy hasn't seen his daughter for two years and he just kind of stands there, you know, like. It, it's maybe yeah. nitpicky, but that scene rang really false to me. And it's like, you can still tell the same story and play it emotionally true, which would be the daughter, the dad would get extremely overwhelmed. He would be like, I haven't seen you for two years. And she would respond to that with coldness or she could respond awkwardly, but to have him just kind of stand there after he's worked, he's done all of this to get back to her and they don't sell any emotion in that moment is just really... It's confusing to me because it's clear that they like these are good storytellers, so I I don't get it. But on a whole, sure, sure. So they shoot themselves in the foot a couple times, but they set up something that was strong enough to affect me, and to me that's still good. So I'd give it like a B or a B minus in terms of thing. But a lot of popcorn storytelling, the actual root story of it is like a C or a C minus. And I still like it because it's in entertainment, you know? Yeah. Um, well, okay. So my take on that, I would probably give it a C. And it's cool that you had a lot of like really concrete uh, reasons for your take because I'm just going to respond with a lot of vibes. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, I... Uh, uh, I mean, one thing is is the th those three characters, you know, um, Edgen, his daughter, and the barbarian. <laughs> uh, yeah. Some they did not feel like a family to me. I don't know how to. I, yeah, it's all vibes, I guess. I'm a terrible movie reviewer, but I I guess I could say uh, maybe this is where I will say that it felt like they did not the actors did not have chemistry or something um mm -hmm. but yeah and, and maybe it's what you're talking about with like that scene and with her anger being anger being like awkwardness or uh yeah something like that but the what you were describing there where it, it felt off i felt a lot of that um the honestly the best like emotional connection i felt is that scene where um, she talks to her ex-husband, the halfling? Yeah. And uh, then she comes out of it Bradley being Cooper really sad, and then he, like, sings a song, and then they're, like, kind of both okay with it. That yeah. felt That felt real to me. And pretty much every other, like, emotional moment, it did not... I wasn't feeling it. Yeah, I... I... I, I I believe their relationship was believable. I'm fine with that. Um, and I think they established enough of... Maybe it's just the, the montage and the music worked for me when they show you, like... When they show you, like, the shots that they've shown you before, but all of a sudden you realize, like, you... Like, I don't know. I hadn't put together, even though they had shown me, but that, like, Kira, I believe is the daughter's name, her mom right. is... Mm -hmm. The barbarian Holga. I, I looked it up by the way. Holga is the barbarian's name. That that moment where you, they showed it to you, but they didn't. They kind of almost hid it from you, and the the daughter's honestly not that much of a character, so I'm okay with it. Like the idea of that is powerful enough that it got me. I mean, I'd rather something attempt to do something real and fumble it than just like not attempt to have any real storytelling at all. You know, which you'd be yeah. surprised how much that happens. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, of course. But, yeah, you know, I I'm a little embarrassed. I should have had more concrete. I I'll watch it again and then I'll get back to you for sure and try to get to the bottom of what I was feeling. It might have just been like the chemistry of the moment that I was not feeling it, and on a second watch, I might feel it. But yeah, but I mean, it's 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 because to me, I, honestly, I would argue that the reason you don't feel it is because the first moment you actually see these characters together, it falls flat. Like, it just does not yeah. work. And you need that establishing moment. You need Kira... Because, look, you're awkward around people that you don't know or you don't really care about, right? 
you're mm-hmm. angry around your family when you're mad at them, you know? Yeah. Um, there should be a deep well of emotion between them, and you should see that their negative their, that their relationship is not in a good place. What they show you is just kind of like slight confusion and that they don't actually seem to really care about each other. It, But that being said, like I said, I, I still cried. And any movie that can make me cry, I think, works on some level. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You know, it wasn't Mighty Joe Young, though. That's the one that <laughs> really gets the tears flowing for me. All right. Well, um... <laughs> No comment. Uh, you've explained really well how the movie was quite competent and yeah. actually really yeah. well done in a lot of ways. And I just said in my monologue that it was a competent movie. But to me, that's kind of not the point. I just think they like they missed at the very beginning, which is what does a D&D movie need to be? And I think they just didn't execute on what a D&D movie needs to be. Yeah. I, the, the, the challenge I would put forward is... I have talked to other people who have watched this movie, who really enjoyed this movie, mm-hmm. and who play D and D, who have played D and D for your, the last like three years, who are kind of in the new wave of D and D people, you know, yep. since like Stranger Things and everything has made it popular. And yeah, Stranger one Things of the critical things, role, yeah, yeah. And one of the things that uh, this person said was, it felt like getting your friends together and having a fun campaign. And part of me is wondering if, like, what they prioritized to show through D&D was the, ex- like, the experience of the thing that I used to like about D&D as a kid versus the system. But you can have your... They, they should try and succeed in both, you know? Um, yes, and I, think most and I completely it agree. Just, it did feel yeah. like... And honestly, I would just frame that almost as a criticism maybe because i'm a grump but like what D D is is amateur storytellers telling amateur stories and it's great because it's you and your friends and it's your stories right but like yeah why you know if you're professionals and you're going to tell a professional D D story like let's make it a professional D story i guess but you know i yeah. can see it like it's not it's not totally without merit you know no one's done it before, as far as I know. Let's try to capture like what is the what is it like to play D and D. Let's t- let's put that in a movie. No one's done that before, so you know, fair enough. What are you talking about, man? The '90s D and D movie with Jeremy Irons? It's a masterpiece. <laughs> um, Do you remember us watching that that one night? Oh man, we were so stoked, and then we, we were so hyped. And like stoked. ten minutes into the movie, we were like, "What is this crap?" <laughs> you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I listen to a lot of film critics and a lot of people talk about movies and everybody talks about that first moment where you realized that you don't like every movie. <laughs> right. Um, yes. And, and that was kind of that one for, for us. All right. Well, I, I, I think, um, I think it's a much better movie than it is a D and D movie, you know? Um, yes. I think, and you know, they, I can agree with that. Also, shout out to the directors and um, writers. Uh, if you have not watched their other movies, um, well, they wrote Spider Man Homecoming. They didn't direct it, but they wrote Spider Man Homecoming. Um, but their big movie that they wrote and directed is called Game Night, which Game Night is. Oh, you told me about Game Night. I still have not seen it. Game Night is top notch comedy, like watch game night if you haven't seen it and uh, have a good time awesome all right well uh let's end it there okay so uh thanks so much for for being on the channel and i don't know maybe we could do it again sometime yeah for sure um you know as long as there's a movie that i feel like i can add my two cents on you know i'm happy to talk about it awesome all right well we'll see what happens okay he's off the call so it's just us again I think that went really well. It seemed like we agreed on a lot, but still had very different reactions overall. So you guys kind of get two different opinions on the movie from two very different perspectives, and that's what I wanted from this. If you watched Honor Among Thieves, let me know in the comments whether you agreed more with me or Thaddeus. Also, please let me know if you like this style of video. Like I said, I tried something new here. And I'm interested to hear how well I pulled it off and whether there could be an audience for more videos like this in the future. Some specific questions I'm curious about are, 
Did you like the one hour conversational content? Are you interested in hearing my opinions on movies in the future? If yes, should I stick specifically to films in the D&D zeitgeist? Also, what did you think of our guest? If I could rope him into it again, would you like to see him back? If you have an opinion on any of these questions, please let me know in the comments. This video was made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon, Marchitar, Aurelian, Root1, Todd, Jason, Jeff, Ghost Coast. Also, a special thank you to our newest supporters, Kayo, Merrick, and Carlos. Thank you so much for your support. And then finally, as always, a special thank you to the guy who started it all, C.A. Castaway. Gentlemen, I won't let you down.